We have on the stage with us not only Lord Alton, but our Dean Marcus Cole, who I'll start by introducing. Marcus Cole is the founder of our Religious Liberty Initiative at the Law School. He is the Joseph A. Madison Dean and Professor of Law at Notre Dame Law School. He began his term in 2019, and since then he has pr proved that his vision is bold and courageous, and that he cares about many different issues dealing with human rights and uh, issues protecting the vulnerable, and some of that work is done through our Religious Liberty Initiative. Without his support, it would not be possible. Lord Alton is also on the stage, and he and Marcus will have a fireside chat about this book. So I won't uh, explain much about the book because I know they're going to have many more wonderful things to tell you. But I will note that Lord Alton is on our, <clears throat> he's for 18 years, Lord Alton has been a member of the House of Commons. In 1997, he was appointed as an independent member of the House of Lords, and he's the author of 11 books. Lord Alton is a professor at Liverpool Hope University and formerly a professor of citizenship at Liverpool John Wars University. He's a co-founder of the Jubilee Campaign, a recipient of the Thomas More Award for Religious Freedom, a former board member of Aid to Church in Need. We have a representative of Aid to Church in Need here tonight. And he was presented in 2019 with the State Department Award for his work on human rights by Ambassador Sam Brownback. Lord Alton is also a member of our Board of Advisors for the Notre Dame Law School Religious Liberty Initiative, and he'll be receiving this year in London at the summit that we hold annually, our Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty, which we present annually. And difficult to think of someone more worthy of that award than Lord Alton. So please join me in giving our two guests a round of applause. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and um, I, I first, before I do anything else, I want to thank Professor Stephanie Barkley, our faculty director of the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative. Uh, the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative is only three years old, and yet it has now become a global force in the fight for religious freedom. Uh, and so we're so honored to be able to host this event here in London, and especially with our very good friend, Lord David Altman. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Lord Altman. And I first have to, uh, I, uh, I told you already that this is an incredible book. Uh, it is uh, uh, amazingly illuminating about the whole history of genocide and the, the law surrounding genocide and the, the, uh, the incidents of genocide in our current society, our culture, and around the world. But I have to ask you first, why genocide? How did this subject or this topic occur you know, why, why, why are you putting such passion into it? Well, Marcus, first of all, let me thank you and Notre Dame. A year ago, I came to South Bend and gave a lecture for the Nanavik Institute about genocide and why it matters. And it was around that time that Dr. Ohab, or Relina Ohab, who's here with me this evening, were putting the finishing touches to, to the book. It was, a, it was a lockdown initiative in some ways, and for me it was something that I'd been wanting to do for a long time. And it goes right back into my childhood for reasons we can talk about if, you, if you're interested. But I wanted to write about some of the experiences, some of the campaigns I've been involved in, and some of the contemporary issues of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes against you, of, of aggression. All of these things, it seemed to me we go around in circles. We say never again, but it happens all over and all over and all over again. And why is that? Because when you look at the Genocide Convention itself, from 1948, it was an attempt after the horrors of the Holocaust to try and prevent such mass atrocities occurring again. And so I wanted to record stories. I wanted to record failed attempts and also the possibilities of completing the work that Raphael Emkin, the Jewish lawyer who'd seen more than 40 of his own family killed during the extermination of the Jewish population by the Nazis, the fulfillment of his hopes and aspirations, which is still, it, somehow we haven't managed to grasp that and make it happen, and yet I do think that if liberal democracies and countries that uphold the rule of law uh, did more, there's no reason why we shouldn't start to achieve those things. So we started to write these things, and Evelina, who has a doctorate in human rights law and studied deeply, and from her own origins in Eastern Europe as well, has a profound understanding of some of the atrocities that have been committed. We were able to use our joint expertise to put this book together. And I'm so pleased that people are going to have the opportunity of receiving the book. It's difficult reading at times, some of the stories, 
there are people here tonight. Uh, I saw Rahima Mahmoud a few minutes ago, who is a Uyghur. Uh, and many of you will know the story of the Uyghurs. And it's always a privilege to, to be with Rahima. This is a continuing genocide. So this isn't just about history, it's about what's happening today. Well, um, speaking of history, you, uh, you open the book uh, describing the history. You mentioned uh, Raphael Lemkin, the Polish lawyer who uh, coined the term uh, genocide and the whole history of the genocide uh, uh, convention. Do you think he'd be disappointed with us today, um, given where we are? Yes, Marcus, I think he would be profoundly disappointed when you think about what is happening at the moment in Ukraine, or when you think about what happened simultaneously. 600,000 people at least, I met two of the people who come from Tigray, who, who came into Parliament yesterday to meet Ewelina and I, and they were discussing some of the atrocities that have occurred there. We failed to stop those things from happening. Now, why is that? It's often for political reasons. It's often because of things like vetoes. I mean, the Rome Statute led to the creation of the International Criminal Court. This country, United Kingdom, of course, is a member of the group of nations that created the ICC. But every time you try to get a referral to the ICC, almost every time, invariably, a veto will be used by either Russia or China from preventing the referral from proceeding. So take the case of North Korea. Ten years ago this year, Justice Kirby, a remarkable jurist from Australia, said he headed up a United Nations Commission of Inquiry into the atrocities that had led to probably 300,000 people being incarcerated in the camps in North Korea. Uh, he found, as a result of taking evidence from many of those who had escaped, there were 30,000 escapees now in South Korea, there were a thousand in the United Kingdom. He found evidence of crimes against humanity, and I'm not using that in a rhetorical way, but as a technical phrase. He said there are crimes against humanity, and he recommended that the things that he had found, the evidence that he had, should be referred to the International Criminal Court for prosecution. It has never happened, because China always says that it will veto any, any attempt to make that happen. So yes, of course, Lemkin would would sit, say, why haven't you achieved the things that I set out to do? The, eight, the 1948 Convention on the Crime of Genocide lays duties on the signatories, they include the United States and ourselves, first of all, to prevent it from happening. Secondly, to provide protection for those who are likely to be affected. And thirdly, then to punish those who were responsible for those atrocities. We don't prevent, we don't protect, we don't punish. And since Bosnia, there's a further duty. That is to predict, to look for the emerging signs of genocide and to stop it in its tracks. And we still don't do that either. So, and in the United Kingdom, we say, yeah, we're signatories to this. But the government will say, it's all right for the Foreign Secretary, it was Liz Truss, who said, this is a genocide against the Uyghurs. But we, the government, can't recognize that because only a court can decide, knowing that there is no court in power to do that in the United Kingdom. And of course, the International Criminal Court are never going to hear it because the Chinese are hardly going to refer themselves to the ICC. So you get President Trump and then President Biden and the Secretary of State Blinken all saying that what is happening is a genocide. Mike Pompeo said the same thing. You have our Foreign Secretary saying the same. We have an independent tribunal. Uh, which was chaired by my good friend, Sir Geoffrey Nice KC, a distinguished lawyer who had been the prosecutor in Bosnia, all saying this is a genocide. And still nothing happens because we say a court has got to decide. Now, guess what? In Germany, recently, in the case of a Yazidi, they found, the court found, that genocide had been committed against the Yazidis. Ten years ago, I called for that to be recognised as a genocide in the UK. And again, we've got the same lame excuse, only a court can decide. Well, here's a court that has decided. In Germany, we don't recognize that either. So it, they don't want it to be recognized. Why? Because politics interferes. What, I got interested in this as a, as a boy when my grandfather, who'd been a, a soldier in the First World War, he'd brought back photographs from the Holy Land. He'd been injured in the trenches and then re-enlisted went with Allenby and was in the army there and saw examples of execution of Armenians. 1.3 million Armenians were slaughtered by the Ottoman Turks. Turkey has always refused to recognize this as a genocide. 
My grandfather brought back photographs of people who had been executed in Jerusalem. I still have them. Yeah. And that had a profound effect on me. But then when you start to look into this, who was it who said, well, who now remembers the Armenians? It was Adolf Hitler. And it was almost as though it gave him a license for impunity to do nothing about it. And had anyone predicted what might be coming? Or well, curiously, it was a man called William Ewart Gladstone. Now, I, I can say this because I know that you have Liverpool antecedents and uh, family in Liverpool, which is, uh, as everybody here knows, the centre of the universe. So, <laughs> and uh, I hope there are no Manchester United fans here C tonight. Centre of the football uh, universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you win 7-0, of course, uh, that's quite a triumph. It was Mr. Gladstone who made his very last speech in an area that I went on to represent uh, a century later as a young councillor, uh, student. It was in that area, there was a place called Hengler Circus. He came out of retirement. It was the very last speech he gave. He was in his 90s. And he said, what do you think has brought an old man like me out of retirement? And he said it was two Armenian gentlemen who had been to see him to describe the massacres that had been taking place during the 1890s. And so roll the clock forward, no one listened. Well, thousands of people heard his speech, but no one did anything about it, and it would lead as a result to the Armenian genocide. When I went to northern Iraq in 2019, I met Assyrian Christians, I met Yazidis, I even met some Armenians as well, because there are still some scattered around in, in northern Iraq. And the slow burn genocide that began in the early 20th century continues against those minorities to this day. Well, I know you have a long history of speaking out um, on behalf of oppressed people and oppressed communities uh, around the world. Tell me a little bit about uh, your relationship with Lord Ahmed and uh, how your uh, relationship uh, expressed itself in, in your passion for, for fighting for the, uh, the oppressed. Well, for people who don't know Tariq, Tariq Ahmed is Minister of State in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But actually, there is an amusing story here because uh, he comes from an Ahmadi background, and Ahmadi Muslims are very badly treated in many parts of the world. In Pakistan, they are persecuted. Uh, recently, there have been cases of people being murdered, of cemeteries being desecrated, uh, and people being arraigned on vexatious false charges of blasphemy, which can then lead to the death penalty. Even in the United Kingdom, there was a case of a man who got in his car in Bradford, in Yorkshire, and drove up to Glasgow and murdered an Amity shopkeeper. One was a Sunni, the other was an Amity. He said that the Amity had blasphemed by wishing his Christian customers a happy Easter and because the shopkeeper had described himself as an Amity Muslim. And he said, this is a blasphemy. He went and he murdered that man. Oh. Uh, the murderer is in prison, but the persecution of Amities continues. So we have a minister of state who understands persecution. His family had to leave Pakistan because of all of that. Now, when I was a young MP, member of the House of Commons, I got letters about the Amadis, and I was asked to meet a group of people from their community. And a group of fairly young people came in and talked to me about it. Years and years passed, and uh, the Minister of State, as he now was uh, in the Foreign Office, Lord Ahmed, said to me, you won't remember this, but we wrote, he said, when I was a young man, people from the Wimbledon Mosque we wrote to a group of MPs, and we got one reply, and we came to see the MP concerned, and he took an interest in what we were doing. He said, that was you. He said, and you're getting your own back now, he said, they're constantly inundating me with letters about other people who are being persecuted. <laughs> so you've got to keep some perspective and even a sense of humor about it. I like him enormously. Uh, he, he's very patient. He has to put up with endless questions from me about issues I care deeply about. You'll see in the section on the Uyghurs that since I, I went out to Western China uh, back in 2002 and then on to Tibet, uh, and since then, I, on over 400 occasions, I've asked questions, written letters, had debates in the House. I'm vice chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on the Uyghurs, but it often falls to Tariq to have to reply to those questions. So I, you know, I'm grateful that we have ministers like him who do take an interest and don't just brush you off. Um, uh, and I regard him as a, a very good public servant. Well, I know you need allies like that in order to accomplish the work that you're, you're trying to get done. Um, uh, I know that uh, this book, State Responses of, uh, uh, to, to Crimes of Genocide, was originally um, supposed to be called uh, Getting Away with Genocide? Well, that was our preferred title. Evelina will confirm this. 
getting away with genocide, because people do get away with genocide. Look, yesterday and today, uh, I've chaired a meeting as part of an inquiry for the All Party Group on Sudan. Uh, Rebecca Tinsley, who's here with me, she, we, were, uh, we went to Rwanda together. We saw the genocide sites, and Becky said to me on the way back, that's all very well, David, but we should also be going on to Darfur. I'm sure that there's the beginning of a genocide there. And somehow she managed to change our, our plane tickets, and we ended up going to Janina, uh, and Becky took some very compelling evidence from some of the women who described the horrendous things that were happening to them when they were leaving the camps to collect firewood. Janjaweed militia would turn up, they were raped. This is 20 years ago. I took evidence from some of the tribal leaders from the men. Two million people had been displaced. And when you think about the small boats and migrant crisis, one of the top five countries that people still flee from is Sudan. Well, guess what? If you or I were in that situation, we'd probably be trying to do the same. You've got to tackle the root causes here. There are 100 million displaced people in the world. And religious persecution, crimes against humanity, genocide, they all play into the reasons why we have this massive displacement of people. So tackle the root causes. Anyway, we went there. So it is 20 years ago. I came back. I wrote a, an article for the independent newspaper. And I persuaded them that they should take it seriously. And much to my amazement, they ran it on the front page. And it said, if this isn't genocide, what is? I recalled that yesterday because online, as part of the current inquiry we're doing to mark what happened 20 years ago, and which continues to this day in Darfur, 30,000 people still being displaced each year, killings still taking place, not on the same scale, but nevertheless still taking place because these are the wrong people. They're the wrong color. They're the wrong creed. They're, they are Muslim, but they're not the right kind of Muslims. They don't follow extreme versions of Islamization through Wahhabism and so on. So they get, they get singled out for that reason. And on the line yesterday, we had Louis Marino Acampo, who was the prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. And this was one of the rare cases that got through to the ICC. And he found that there was a case of genocide to be answered. And he said that the head of state, um, the, the, the president of, of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, was guilty of the crime of genocide. And after the uh, collapse of that government, its replacement by a civilian government, he was arrested. And there was talk even of holding the trial in Khartoum. But since then, there's been a military coup. And some of those who would also be arraigned with him are also now back in the regime running the country. So, it's gone off the agenda, but he's still in prison. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in what Ocampo said yesterday. He said, it's still so important to bring him to trial because that would send a message to all of these other people who are doing the same things. And he said, and you know, it would send a message to people like Putin as well that one day their moment may come. And for me, you know, what can you do? You have to have a judicial process that holds people to account for the crimes that they commit. And in Putin's case, there are clear, there's clear evidence of the crimes of aggression. It's why we've been campaigning to see uh, an international tribunal established. If the ICC can't do it, then a willing coalition of nations who believe in the ruling, the upholding of the rule of law, they should be organizing such a trial to take place, even in absentia, to show that we have values that matter more than those values that are, we see every day in places like Mariupol, or in Bucha, or in the terrible atrocities that are committed uh, against innocent people, the abduction of children to Russia. A, a wonderful woman, Christina Lamb, one of our great journalists in the UK, wrote a compelling piece two weeks ago for the Sunday Times newspaper uh, about the children who have been abducted, who are now being re-educated uh, out of their own culture and their languages and so on. This all fits within the definitions that Lemkin laid down to the crime of genocide. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call it genocide yet, but I most certainly would call it crimes against humanity and crimes of aggression, and believe that they should be arraigned on those charges at this stage. OK, so that, that raises the, the legal questions. And um, uh, I, I'd like for you to, to talk a little bit about what is the legal definition of genocide and why would some cases uh, uh, rise to that level, and um, why would others not? Well, it's quite interesting to look at the position of the Uyghur community uh, in Xinjiang in that context. It isn't about 
the mass annihilation of people. It's not necessarily, therefore, about the extermination camps that we saw in Nazi Germany, but it is about things like your right to reproduce and the taking away of your culture and your language. And this ethnic cleansing, this can be one of the reasons why genocide can be determined. And that was the conclusion that Sir Geoffrey Nice QC's uh, independent tribunal, why they found the case of genocide. In fact, in, on many other counts, they said, we can't find genocide, but we can find crimes against humanity. Not that, you know, this is, may in some technical senses be a lesser crime, but it's still an extraordinarily serious thing to say. Um, this is what Lenkin himself wrote. He said, new conceptions require new terms. And of course, even the word didn't exist. Churchill said, the monstrosities of the extermination camps in the Holocaust. He said, define any language that we have. He said, we need language to express it. And Lemkin gave us that. Genos and Sidae, these were the family, genos and Sidae, the cutting of the family. That's the genocide. He said, by genocide, we mean the destruction of a nation or an ethnic group. The new word coined by the author, that is Lemkin, to denote an old practice in its modern development is made from the ancient Greek word and the Latin, thus corresponding in its formation to such words as tyrannicide, homicide, infanticide, etc. Generally speaking, genocide did not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. And I could go on, but if people are going to read the book, then they can read the definition. I put it rather more prosaically uh, further in the book when looking at the situation in Xinjiang. This is what I wrote. This was after meeting Rahima and some of the people that she introduced me to. What word does best describe what is happening in Xinjiang? What word comes to your mind when you hear evidence of a state involved in the destruction of the people's identity, involved in mass surveillance, involved in forced labor and enforced slavery, involved in the uprooting of people, the destruction of communities and families, the prevention of births, the ruination of cemeteries where, where generations of loved ones have been buried. What mind comes to mind, what word comes to mind when you hear of people being forcibly indoctrinated to believe that you, your people, your religion, your culture never existed, and with the certainty that through ethno religious cleansing you will cease to exist? Those whose signature is written across these monstrous crimes know that name well but smugly sleep content, believing that corrupted and compliant self-serving institutions, combined with a loss of nerve in countries which have the privilege of democratic institutions, the rule of law, human rights, have thus far enabled them to avoid international censure or the risk of being arraigned before a court of law on the charge of genocide. And how easily we forget. Recall how in Europe, bureaucrats identified who was a Jew confiscated property, used their victims as slave labour, scheduled trains to uproot them from their homes and communities, and deprived them of livelihoods and position in society, and how German pharmaceutical companies tested drugs on camp prisoners, confiscated personal property, shaved heads, sent hair, jewellery and other artefacts as trophies, and then made prisoners build their crematoria. Genocides do not happen overnight. They emerge from a casual indifference to discrimination and persecution, and then from crimes against humanity, it seamlessly morphs into a full-blown genocide. So I hope that does some justice to your question. Yes, but absolutely. The technical, the crime of genocide, we, def we define it here, the technical si crime is a crime under international law which the civilized world condemns and for the commission of which principals and accomplices, whether private individuals, public officials, or statesmen, and whether the crime is committed on religious, racial, political, or any other grounds of punishment, invites member states, those who are signatories, to enact necessary legislation from the prevention and punishment of this crime, and recommends that international cooperation be organized between states with a view to facilitating the speedy prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. So this is unfinished work from 1948. Incidentally, it's also this year, the 75th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are 30, 30 articles in that declaration. I often say that Article 18 is like an orphan right, 
Article 18 is the article that insists that everyone has the right to believe, not to believe, or to change your belief. And that's honoured in its breach the world over. But Article 18 is often just like a canary in the mine. But if you ignore it, if you ignore discrimination, hate speech, the othering of a group of people because of their religion or their race, if you don't treat the human dignity of every human being as being unique and have no separation because of their colour, their creed, their class, their orientation, their gender, their ability range, but because each person is precious, then you have some chance, I think, in upholding human dignity, which is the other side of the coin from human rights. And those two things surely march hand in hand. I know that's something close to your heart, Mark. Yes, very, very important. I, th I think that, the, that religious freedom is the indicator of whether or not rights are being respected generally. Now, you said something earlier about the importance of courts. And I wonder if you could speculate for me why the African case made it to the ICC and what it is we can do. I know you've been working here in the UK to try to, to create a mechanism by which we can have a court declaration of genocide um, to, to fill this vacuum. So why do you suppose the African case made it to the ICC when others won't? Well, for one reason, geopolitics was not quite uh, as acute then as it perhaps is now. Uh, Russia and China didn't threaten the use of vetoes. It was in the aftermath, of course, of Rwanda, where many people, including the former president of the United States, the former prime minister of the United Kingdom, our ambassador, who is a friend of mine, who was the British ambassador at the United Nations, he said it was the biggest mistake of his diplomatic career not to see this writing on all the signs that were coming. And of course, a million people were murdered uh, in Rwanda as the international community looked on. So I think that it was in the context of all of that. And the Rome statute seemed like as something that might be worth trying, that it might be worth trying to get a referral to the ICC. And Ocampo proved it, although not without resistance. There was some resistance from the United States, which isn't a signatory to the Rome Statute, and wasn't sure that it liked the idea of a universal court of this kind being able to sit in judgment, but it didn't veto its, its uh, referral. Uh, there was a lack of enthusiasm in a number of quarters, I might add, but the prosecutor took his job really seriously, and he got on with it. He made it happen. I gave evidence using some of the material that Rebecca and I had collected uh, during our own visit, and colleagues of mine as well who had been able to go out and see the situation firsthand. Um, but even that is unfulfilled for reasons I described earlier on. What can we do more in the UK along the lines you've just suggested? Well, I've introduced a bill now several times uh, into the House of Lords. Uh, it's on the back of amendments that I moved to our, to our trade bill, to our telecommunications bill, to our National Health Service bill. And there are endless amendments that I've moved cross-party, uh, bicameral, with friends in both houses supporting these proposals, including in the House of Lords, former chief justices, former Lord Chancellors. So the top of the legal world in the UK. So this isn't some maverick idea. And indeed, one of the people I helped uh, to get advice from in the crafting of the amendment is a former Supreme Court judge who sits in the House of Lords. So I know that this, the arguments are compelling, it's possible to do it, and the bill and the amendments uh, seek to give power to the High Court of England and Wales and its uh, comparable uh, neighbour in Scotland in order to be able to adjudicate whether the evidence that is presented amounts to a, 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 at least on the evidence, a prime facie case of genocide. So this isn't about bringing someone to trial. This is about looking at the evidence to and see. making a de declaration. Making a declaration based on the details of the genocide convention. Mm -hmm. So turning the rhetoric into action. Mm -hmm. And of course, the uh, diplomats in the Foreign Office don't like the idea of that, because Why? that would take away their power in order to block things those who want to try and make trade deals, who don't seem to particularly care sometimes uh, about who they're doing business with. Now, I'm a free trader. If you go back and look at Richard Cobden, who was the great author of free trade in the beginning of the, the uh, 19th century, he drew a line. He said he was an opponent of the slave trade when it wasn't fashionable to be one. He said, yes, I am a free trader, but not when you're selling human beings in the trade. He was a, an opponent of the opium trade 
uh, in the mid 19th century. He led great parliamentary debates against it. So there are limitations on free trade. And I don't therefore accept the arguments that I hear from some who say, everyone commits human rights violations, therefore we, ha we wouldn't be able to trade with anyone. Well, maybe countries do commit human rights violations, but this is the crime above all crimes. It's of a different order. And that's why my amendment and my bill singles out the crime of genocide and says, if there is evidence of genocide, then the following things must happen. And duties then fall on the government in a way that at the moment they say, oh, well, no court has decided, therefore we, don't, we can't take this to the Security Council. We can't, you know, this country sits on the Security Council. What is the point of being a member of that? We sit in the United Nations Human Rights Council. What's the point of being a member if you don't face up some of those who are responsible for these things? Now, I will give credit to Dominic Raab when he was Foreign Secretary and our current Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, both have been to the Human Rights Council and both have called out um, the crimes that have been committed against Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but they never use the word genocide, even though there is plenty of evidence to, as you will hear later on from Rahima and others, to suggest that at least this should be, be examined in that context rather than simply human rights violations. And so I want to ask you about the, the, the crime of genocide and, and one of the elements of the, the crime, as I understand it from your book, is the element of specific intent. Yep. And I, w I, would, I would like to get your opinion, your thoughts about uh, what Raphael Lemkin would think of that particular element and whether you see that as an obstacle to uh, prosecuting this crime. It, it, it can be an obstacle, but it ought to be an obstacle. I, this is not a trivial question. And it ought, if you shouldn't be able to just use the word genocide to describe anything that may be happening that you don't like. Okay. Uh, so this is a, it is a technical term. It was deliberately framed in that way. It's a, it's a high bar to meet, and so it should be. Uh, but would I say that what happened to the Yazidis 10 years ago this year, that what happened in Darfur 20 years ago this year was a genocide? Yes, I would. Would I say that what's happening to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang is a genocide? On the basis of what I've seen, yes, I would. But I want, in this sense, I support the government. I want a court of law to examine that and for them to decide mm -hmm. if it meets that standard and that test. <laughs> and we are famed as a country for having upheld, certainly historically upheld, uh, international law. And we were amongst those who framed uh, some of the great documents that I've been referring to this evening. So it, we, above all countries, should be doing more in this area. And you, as a... Uh, as lawyers in, in your law faculty are to be commended. I, the audience may not know what you've already done in the case of the Uyghurs, uh, but I know that uh, Sam Brownback and I have both uh, given statements of support for what the, your school has done in supporting the World Uyghur Congress uh, in the courts in Argentina by making an amicus brief. And I think this is fantastic because every time a court looks at this and comes to the same determinations as the rest of us, it, may, it is a compelling case. And I believe in the upholding of the rule of law, but I recognize that sometimes you feel like Sisyphus, you know, pushing the boulder all the time and it coming back on you. It's much easier, no doubt, to be a dictator, but look what authoritarian regimes are doing in the names of dictators the world over. And we have to use all the proper instruments of democracies and of countries that uphold the rule of law. Well, let's talk a little bit about that boulder, right? Um, China is arguably the most powerful authoritarian regime in the history of the world. What uh, effect, what, what good can a court declaration of a finding of genocide do to, um, a, uh, to a country that that can put thousands of tanks in the field and artillery and planes and ships all around the world. Why, why should China fear a, a court declaration? I think it's, it shames a country. And I think that does have a profound effect. Margaret Thatcher, when she went to meet Deng Xiaoping in Hong Kong, uh, when they were discussing the creation of two systems, one country, Deng Xiaoping said to her, we could send in the tanks tomorrow in Hong Kong, and there is nothing you could do about it. And Margaret Thatcher famously replied to him, but the whole world would see what you are doing. And he laughed, and he knew that that was true. Now, in Xi Jinping, I think we have someone cast in the mold of Mao Zedong rather than Deng Xiaoping, and we've rolled the clock back, sadly, towards those days, and you are right. I mean, we see 
the atrocities there have been in Tibet. We see what's happened in Xinjiang, and it's worth noting that the person who was responsible for the suppression of Tibetan people, he was exactly the member of the Chinese Communist Party who was, who was put in place in Xinjiang in order to do the same things. We've seen the destruction of democracy in Hong Kong. Ben Rogers is here tonight uh, from Hong Kong Watch. Ben and I have traveled together in North Korea, in Burma, and I was amongst a team of monitors of the last three elections in Hong Kong in 2019. And we see what is happening in Taiwan and the South China Sea every single day, where 23 million people are being threatened uh, with the loss of their freedoms and liberties. One of the few things that seems to have really stung the CCP was when uh, Michel Bachelet, the United Nations Special Rapporteur, was allowed admission into Xinjiang. Most of us thought it would probably be just a whitewash and public relations exercise. It proved not to be, and she came out and she was very specific about the kinds of crimes that she knew that there was evidence pointing towards. China was furious about it, and it, but it enabled then the UK to lay a, a motion before the Human Rights Council about that report. So all the time you've got to keep pressure up. And you have to keep pressure up where it hurts, through the pocket, through the economy. And I think it's worth mentioning, if I can just find the section here. Yeah. According to uh, an Australian uh, foundation, there are strong indications, and this is directly from the book on page 78, that some 80,000 Uyghurs have been forced to work in factories that form part of the supply chain of at least 83 global brands. I'll just give you a handful of them. Abercrombie & Fitch, Acer, Adidas, Amazon, Apple, ASUS, BMW, Bosch, Calvin Klein, Carter, Karuti, Dell, Electrolux, Silla, Gap, General Electric, General Motors, Google, Huawei, Jack Jones, Jaguar, Lacoste, Land Rover, Mercedes-Benz, Nikkei, and so on. Siemens is on that list. I tell the story in the book of, some of you will have heard of Corrie ten Boom, a, a great Dutch yeah. Christian woman. She and her sister, uh, in their father's watchmaking uh, office house, they lived above the office, they started to take in, during the, the Holocaust, Jewish escapees. And they were eventually caught, although they helped take a lot of people to safety. And they were sent to uh, Ravensbrück. And her sister died there in the camp. Uh, Corrie survived, but she was part of the forced labor that was working in the Siemens factory in the Nazi, under the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Siemens is one of those companies that recently accompanied uh, Chancellor Schultz on his visit uh, to Beijing to do business as usual. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris Patton, who I admire greatly and was our last um, last governor in Hong Kong, but he's at Chancellor of Oxford University, and I know he's a good friend of Notre Dame as well. Chris says, and he gave it in evidence to a select committee I, I serve on, he says, we try to have what he called cakeism, to have our cake and eat it. Mm -hmm. We want to say on one hand that we have all these virtues and uphold all these values, and then we want to do sordid deals with companies that have blood on their hands. So what can we do? We can do what they did during Wilberforce's campaign against the slave trade, uh, which Cobden supported for 40 years. They had to use every, every single thing in the democratic playbook. I mean, it was the first human rights campaign in history. And part of it was about the prohibition in many households in the country of taking sugar from the Caribbean because it had been produced by slave labor. They wore hair braids, they wore lapel badges, am, am I not a man and brother, showing a, a of someone in chains. They got lawyers uh, like um, Granville Sharp, who went before the courts, before Mr. Justice Mansfield, and said this was a boy who was thrown on the streets because he was enslaved. And he was able to demonstrate that under British law, within the United Kingdom, this was illegal. And this was a major breakthrough, because it had implications for the British colonies, where it continued to be legal. But how could you have a law that applied in one place but not another? So harnessing lawyers. Who were the people who organized this? Oh, well, it was inevitably a committee of ladies. And it was the Quaker women. And they, you know, usually there'll be committees of women somewhere organizing things where men talk a lot, and, but uh, they get on and do it. And they, they enlisted a young man who had abandoned his studies at Cambridge University because he got passionate about the slave trade. 
And he became the organizer for 60 years, Thomas Clarkson. And he enlisted the youngest member of the House of Commons, a man called Wilberforce, who never became the leader of a political party, he never became the prime minister, the great panjandrum, all those things. But guess what? <laughs> He's remembered because he took up a cause that someone had to do something about, and he conquered slavery in its day. I mean, there's plenty of modern day slavery to conquer now, but he conquered the transatlantic slave trade, changed our laws, but doing so, it had required the change of hearts and minds. And you could argue that Lemkin picked up the trail, you know, a century later, and said there are still these wicked indignities going on. He'd seen what had happened to the Assyrians, incidentally, in 1930. He'd gone to Simile in northern Iraq and had seen where, it's a place I visited during my visit in 2019, he'd seen where several thousand Assyrian Christians had been murdered. It's what got him interested in atrocity crime, not knowing then that 15 years later, over 40 of his own family would be murdered by the Nazis. So I think it's a baton that passes on through the generations, and it's important. One of the things I really admire about Notre Dame is the formation of your students. I mean, we live in a country where we seem obsessed with peripheral things. And in the academic world, in the academy, instead of being so fixated about cancelling people or trying to rewrite history, how much more important it would be to do the kind of formation that, that you do in your law school, that I've seen firsthand and which I so deeply admire. Um, this I, this is not, wasn't on the agenda. I'm, <laughs> Marcus didn't ask me to say any of this, but I, I just want to say that I, do, I wish I could see evidence in our universities that we were forming tomorrow's leaders in the same way that you're doing, because I think that's the best hope we have for the future. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, really generous of you. Um, I have to tell you that uh, um, one of the most surprising aspects of the book um, is its refusal to, to focus on history and instead to concentrate on the present. And the most compelling aspect, I think, of the book are the stories that you tell of the genocides that are happening right around us, all around the world. You talk, you've already said a lot about what's happening in China with the Uyghurs, but you also um, uh, write about the, the Burmese military's genocide. Yeah, yeah. You talk about uh, Daesh in, in, in the Levant. Um, you talk about the, the genocide in Nigeria, which I think is, is largely um, gone uh, unnoticed or unspoken of in, in the West. Um, and other areas of, of concern. Can you, can you just briefly touch upon what's happening around us and what you think we can do about it? Well, you're right. This wasn't important though history is. It's a great teacher. This is not a historical survey just of what happened in the past. It's about what is happening now mm -hmm. and why we need to be much more effective. And we give some recommendations on how we can become more effective in looking for the signs of genocide, what more we could do to predict and therefore to stop it in its tracks. But in doing that, yes, it inevitably took us to places like Tigray. So over the last 18 months, even during lockdown, we were holding online sessions with people giving their evidence, including from an academic like Professor Jan Neeson, for instance, at Ghent University, who'd spent a lot of his own life in Tigray and therefore was able to give us authenticated information that was coming out on a regular day-by-day -day basis. And this is the upside of social media, dare I say it, that with modern means of communication, we've got to get tools into people's hands so that they can tell their story immediately, so that it doesn't get concealed by those who would rather it was concealed. I mean, there's real anger, I know now, both in Eritrea and in Ethiopia, that their leaders could find themselves arraigned before courts for the things that they gave orders to their own troops and their own mili mili militias to undertake. Some of the stories are deeply disturbing and harrowing, and we didn't include everything for that reason, but some of the stories are in the book. Nigeria. Nigeria could become tomorrow's Sudan. Remember that when I first went to Sudan, two million people had been killed in the war in South Sudan. Two million people. And that was so long before Darfur. And yet you could see that this was unfinished business and that the whole country was going to face partition as a result of the inability to learn to live alongside one another, to respect difference. You know, it's the great challenge of our age, really. How do you learn how to live alongside one another? Our great chief rabbi, now sadly, who is now, now dead, but 
Jonathan, Jonathan Sachs, Sachs yeah. in his book, The Dignity of Difference, and in his book, The Home We Build Together, he sets out a prospectus for how you learn to live together alongside one another in respect. And when you don't, then it leads to atrocities like those which occurred in Sudan. Because in Khartoum, they wanted to impose a particular ideology on the mainly Christian and animist south of the country. What did it lead to? It led to the breakup of the country itself. So we end up with two almost failed states mired in all the terrible wickedness that had occurred there without there having been proper justice, without there having been proper truth, without there being the ability to promote reconciliation. And so both the Republic of Sudan and South Sudan still have enormous issues to have to face. Nigeria could go exactly the same way because of the indifference and the failure to recognize what first Boko Haram, which means to destroy Western education. Isn't it interesting that the first thing you've got to eliminate is the chance, particularly for girls, to be educated. Uh, Boko Haram, they began that campaign. It's now being supported by ISIS West Africa to create a caliphate in the north of the country. And that means the destruction of anyone who refuses uh, to convert. It was five years ago last month, five years ago, since a young girl whose mother I promised, I've met her, Rebecca, I promised her that I would try to raise her daughter's case whenever I got the opportunity, so let me do so again tonight and urge people who are here to write to the Nigerian High Commissioner in London with whom I've raised this case. I've protested outside the Nigerian High Commission, which is just around the corner from here. The girl, Leah Sharabu. Leah was abducted at the age of 14. She was raped and impregnated. They tried to forcibly convert her. She refused to convert. Uh, ISIS announced that she would remain a slave in captivity. She is still alive, and her mother and her family so desperately want her to be returned to them. And, you know, if you're asking yourselves, well, what can I do tonight? Well, Leah Sharibu's case, CSW has a lot about her on their website. There's a similar case in Pakistan of a girl we're trying to get out of there. I campaigned with uh, Professor Riemann, Javad Riemann, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes. Uh, Javed is a professor at Brunel University. He's also a special rapporteur for the United Nations on Iran. And he and I traveled with the all-party parliamentary group on Pakistan minorities, which I co-chair to Pakistan, on behalf of Asiya Bibi, who had been put onto death row for so-called blasphemy. Now, there's a young woman called Maria Shabazz, again abducted as a teenager, raped, forcibly married, escaped. And she and her sisters desperately need to come to a safe country. This country doesn't even recognize that there is persecution. That's the correct word in the context of giving people asylum. We don't even recognize that there's persecution in Pakistan, so we won't find a home for her here. So only last week, uh, I had a meeting with an ambassador from another European country who is more open to maybe taking her. But that is shameful for us. A friend of mine who is, may still be here, yes, he, I think he's still here, Javed Riemann, uh, no, uh, Riemann Chisti, rather, who is a member of parliament. Uh, Riemann, yes, yeah, is, there you are, Riemann. Riemann was the Prime Minister's special envoy on freedom of religion or belief. He's a brave and wonderful man. He's a conservative member of parliament. He resigned in protest as the special envoy when we refused to take Asia Bibi into this country and to give her protection. And I so admired what Riemann did at that time. And it helped to force this issue you know, up the, up the league table, as it were, to try and get people to take this seriously. So I think there's a, you know, it's incumbent on all of us to do what we can in the circumstances we find ourselves, to use the privileges, the liberties, the freedoms, the opportunities that we enjoy to do rather more than maybe we've done hitherto. Well, I'm grateful that you've done more than most. Uh, I think that this United Kingdom is uh, better to have political leaders like you, and this world is better to have moral leaders like you. And I want to thank you for sharing your book with us and sharing your thoughts with us tonight. So thank you. Before. Marcus, thank you. Before we absolutely finish and you get the, you know, the real stars of the show, as it were, to, to come on, can I end with some words from the book? Absolutely. Because the, these are the words of Judge Thomas Bergenthal, who was a young boy and who was incarcerated at Auschwitz. He was a victim of the genocide against Europe's Jews. He survived the Shoah, and he throws down this challenge to us. These are 
his words, and this is about how we break the cycles of hatred that enable these things to happen again and again. He said, the human mind is simply not able to grasp this terrible truth. A nation transformed into a killing machine, programmed to destroy millions of innocent human beings for no reason other than that they were different. If we humans can so easily wash the blood of our fellow humans off our hands, then what hope is there for sparing future generations from a repeat of the genocides and mass killings of the past? One cannot hope to protect mankind from crimes such as those that were visited upon us unless one struggles to break the cycle of hatred and violence that invariably leads to ever more suffering by innocent human beings. So I hope everyone will perhaps take away that challenge that he's passed down to us as someone who survived those terrible events and see in those words also a message of hope as well. well thank you, Anna. Thank you. Dr. Emelina Ocha, as I mentioned, is the other co-author of the book with Lord Alton. Emelina is a talented human rights advocate, an author, and a co-founder of the Coalition for Genocide Response. She works with British politicians on genocide and other international crimes, providing research and working on law and policy proposals. Dr. Ochab has written over 30 reports for the UN, including the Universal Periodic Review. She has made oral and written submissions at the UN Human Rights Council sessions, the UN Forum on Minority Issues, PACE, and other international and regional fora. Dr. Ochab authored the initiative and proposal to establish the UN International Day commemorating victims and survivors of religious persecution. This initiative has led to the establishment of the UN International Day commemorating the victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. Uh, let me just pause there for just a second and see Anna, are our panelists ready to come up to the front? Evelina, if you want to join me right here, I'll scoot over. We will also have the privilege to hear from Evade Reitman. He is a professor of international human rights law and Muslim constitutionalism at Brunel University. Uh, he is one of the leading authorities on the right to freedom of religion or belief and Muslim constitutionalism. In 2018, he was appointed by the UN Nations Human Rights Council as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran and he has acted as a member of the Coordination Committee of the Special Procedures United Nations Human Rights Office. Rahima is also with us tonight, Rahima Mahmoud. She is a Uyghur human rights defender, a translator, and I can personally attest a talented singer. She interpreted for camp survivors during the Uyghur Tribunal, and she has collaborated with mainstream media on breaking news stories related to Uyghur genocide. Rahima has worked at the forefront of the UK's movement for Uyghur human rights, spearheading campaigns at parliamentary and grassroots levels. She is currently a UK director of the World Uyghur Congress, an organization I recommend that you all support. And she is the executive director of Stop Uyghur Genocide, an advisor to the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. Homira Ray Meir Reze is a board member of the World Hazara Council and serves as the chairwoman of the Hazara Committee in the UK, a nonprofit organization working for the protection of Hazaras around the world. Hamira is passionate about women's minority rights and has been a vocal advocate in past years. Hamira was one of the organizers who co-led Stop Hazara Genocide Campaign with increased conversation on persecution of Hazaras in Afghanistan and around the world. She holds a PhD in medical research and is the executive operations officer at Mirzheim Therapeutics. Please join me in welcoming all of our distinguished panelists. <coughs> and thank you very much for introducing the, the speakers or our panelists, so I, I don't have to do um, this work, um, saves a lot of time of course, um, but I would like to welcome uh, our incredible uh, panelists um, who have been working with Lord Alden of course on, on a number of, of important topics. And Dean Marcus Cole mentioned that in this work, Lord Alden has many allies, and these are definitely the allies. Um, but also among uh, our group, we have here Archbishop Angelos, who, who's been working with us also on so many different topics. We have also Brendan O'Hara MP, who is leading a new APPG on international law, justice, and accountability, and has been doing incredible work on 
on so many um, topics and working closely with Lord, Lord Alton, including earlier today on the situation in Darfur. And just a brief comment. Stephanie mentioned earlier that Lord Alton published 11 books. Forget about the 11 books. This is the one that you're supposed to read, okay? So the, the rest is not that important. Of course, just joking, you should read all of them. <coughs> but um, this is an important book, and it was a pleasure to work uh, on this book with Lord Alton. And, um, and briefly before this session, I spoke to Hamira, and we said that this book does not include the situation of the Hazara in Afghanistan. So obviously, I said, no problem. It will be in the second volume. <laughs> so we'll need to start working on that, uh, Lord Alton. <laughs> Maybe not tomorrow. Tomorrow is a special day, but uh, after that, we, we can definitely start working on the next uh, volume. And um, Stephanie already mentioned, of course, the incredible work uh, that our panelists do. And, um, and of course, Homira has been working um, on the situation of, of the Hazara. And she came to us um, to, to tell us about the situation of the Hazara in Afghanistan, the dire situation. And, Lord Alton mentioned, okay, let's do an inquiry into the situation of the Hazara. And it's done. Um, because when Lord Alton says, let's do something, it will be done. This is how it works. Um, and, um, and, and Rahima, Rahima has been doing incredible work um, that, and is mentioned, inclu uh, including in our book, several times because she's such a force of nature and um, she's been driving the work behind the genocide amendment to make sure that we don't talk only about the law, we don't only talk about the politics involved, but we hear the stories of victims, survivors, the, 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 the stories from, from people, the human stories that are so important. And sometimes in our work we, we forget about those stories because we are focused so much on pushing the amendments, making sure that the legislation, legislation is drafted and, and so on. But she brought those important stories um, um, to, to those dif difficult discussions. And Professor uh, Javed Rayman has been doing incredible work. This is not mentioned in his bio, but he's uh, the driving force behind the all-party parliamentary group on Pakistani minorities. Um, again, uh, doing report after report, recommendation after recommendation, to make sure that British politicians are involved and are looking into the situation of those forgotten communities uh, in Pakistan. And, um, and one of the important reports that was published a couple of years now mm -hmm. was on the situation of Hindu and Christian girls in, in Pakistan who are abducted, forcibly converted, forcibly married. Um, and we are talking about at least 1,000 of, of such girls every year. And those stories are not, you, you can't find them um, in the news, uh, unfortunately. So we rarely hear those stories. But enough of me talking, um, and let's hear a little bit from our wonderful, um, wonderful panels. And I see Timothy is with us as well. Um, wonderful to have you with us, and also a wonderful friend um, and supporter of, of so many um, incredible projects that Lord Olaf has been working on. And we'll start with, with, with Homira. And of course, you've been doing, well, you are a scientist, and you are doing incredible work in advocacy. and focusing on the situation of, of, of the Hazara in Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan. But um, let's focus on the situation in Afghanistan. What is happening to the Hazaras in Afghanistan? And what is the world's understanding of the situation? What is being missed? Um, a little bit, uh, I want to introduce uh, who the Hazaras are. Hazaras are an ethnic religious group native to the land or the country we call Afghanistan today. They have a very long history of being persecuted in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, the world is not aware of the historical persecution, nor of what is happening or the current dire situation of the Hazaras. When we were conducting the Hazara inquiry and we brought in uh, witnesses and, and experts, um, majority of them, or the majority, or the, the understanding was this is a slow burn genocide. Uh, and they were, uh, and the community's concern is that it's going to turn into a full-blown genocide <coughs> that Hazaras have experienced in the past, um, which was when the Taliban was in power in the 1990s, and they, they, you know, carried out massacres after massacres in many different parts of Afghanistan. And one example was in August 1998, 
Um, and one of the problems that we had then and the same problem that we face now is the lack of information and document, the lack of documentation of these atrocities that's happened in Afghanistan. So the atrocity or the massacre that they carried out in northern Afghanistan in Mazar Sharif in August 1998, some reports say that up to 15,000 Hazaras were killed by door-to-door -door, uh, search and, and just mass uh, killing of Hazaras in that part of the, of the country. And unfortunately, we see very similar campaigns being carried out against the Hazaras today. And we see an increase in kidnapping uh, of Hazaras, forced disappearance, forced marriages is something that unfortunately is not reported. So we've had many cases of Hazara girls being forced to marry Taliban fighters and Taliban supporters. And these stories are not told anywhere, not in media, not on social media, because these cases happen in parts of Afghanistan that the world doesn't have access to, and they don't have access to social media or to the world, because the lack or, or the collapse of civil society and the lack of information and the fact that journalism is now, a, in a way, a crime in Afghanistan, it makes it impossible to get these stories out to the world. We also see an increased um, uh, of, of, of cases or, or, or Taliban as well as ta uh, sort of Pashtun tribes supported by Taliban that forcibly displacing the Hazaras. Evelyn, if you remember, like last time we spoke last year, and you said, "What is the concern?" And I said, "Once we, once the spring comes, we're going to see an increase of forced displacement of Hazaras." And that was true because, we, according to our calculation, within a couple of months, we saw over 280,000 Hazaras from several parts of Afghanistan were forced to flee their homes, and then. Other people, Pashtuns or Taliban supporters, were resettled in those areas. Again, spring is coming again, and we are predicted to see the same atrocities being committed and, and an increase in forced displacement of Hazaras from uh, these sort of Hazara populated districts. And unfortunately, um, some of the cases that we saw among these forced um, or, or IDPs <coughs> were that. Pregnant women, for example, didn't have access to health care. So we had death of pregnant ladies and newborn babies in the mountains. And these are the stories that as the world is never going to know about. And these are the atrocities, the impact that it has on the community the world doesn't know about. Recently, two weeks ago, the UN Special Rapporteur, Richard Bennett, published his report. Although he does mention that the Hazaras are at risk, he says in his previous report, he said this is a crime against humanity, but the world fails to use the word genocide. While experts, many reports that have been published have said that this is a genocide. So the recognition of genocide, as, as Lord Alton previously mentioned, is so incredibly important, especially when it comes to Hazaras, and especially at the stage that Hazaras are now. I mean, currently the ICCs, for, on, for example, have reopened their investigation on Hazaras. They need to look into crimes of genocide when it, in, in relation to Afghanistan and against the Hazaras. Thank you very much. And, and, and of course, you, you mentioned the conversation that we had. And um, I remember that it will, you, you didn't mention only that in spring we'll see displacement. You said that we'll see mass killings. And I remember as we, at that stage we were still working on the inquiry and we are still looking at the evidence. And I was looking through the news and uh, just waiting for, for the horrible stories and, and, and to see them. And there was nothing on the 21st of um, March, because that, that's, we, uh, we consider that's when the spring starts. But a few, few days later, a few weeks later, there was attack after attack after attack. And uh, so, so then, of course, everything what you said materialized. And we should be thinking about it very soon as well. This is coming yet again. And you run incredible campaign as well, Stop um, Hazara Genocide. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about it? Yes, so on the 30th of September last year, there was an attack against an uh, 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 educational institution called Kaj Education Center, where it was attended by both uh, uh, girls and boys. And in that, they uh, denoted, or they had a bomb explosion, a suicide attacker, that went to the part where it was majority girls were sitting. And as a result, 54 young girls were killed at that attack and hundreds were injured. And so we launched a campaign, a global campaign called Stop Hazar Genocide, and we urged people to speak up against these atrocities. That's, it was just, of course, it was one example, but this kept happening. We remember Seydou Shahadar Girls' School in May 2021, 
when over 85 girls were killed and hundreds of others were injured there as well. But this campaign was a point where the Hazara community knew the Taliban are in power, and they, because we experienced what they did in the 90s, we knew what the, what the future may hold. And so on 8 October, more than 130 different cities organized uh, protests from Asia, even in, 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 in Africa, across the world. And uh, we also launched an online campaign, and we had more than 20 million um, hashtags on Twitter. And this truly reflects the urgency and the concerns the Hazara community have, because they are engaged, they are raising their voice, they want the world to recognize these atrocities happening. But unfortunately, the international community have turned a blind eye. Thank you very much, Homira. And this is also a very sad story that there has been some attention on the Hazara, especially once we published the report. But unfortunately, the, the attention is disappearing and we will witness another wave of atrocities. This is certain. Yeah, so one of the, for example, I shared the report with you with the, uh, was it the UN um, uh, HCR that uh, had their uh, policy brief and our, the Hazara Inquiry report was published on that. So the Hazara Inquiry has been referenced in many parliaments, including the Canadian parliaments, Australian parliaments, but there hasn't been any tangible steps or tangible outcomes where a, a, a government or, or organizations have said this is what we're doing to prevent further atrocities. And indeed, one of the recommendations is to take Afghanistan before the International Court of Justice. But for this, we need the political will of, of states to do this, exactly. of course. Exactly. Thank you very much, uh, Homira. And now we'll go to Rahima. Rahima, of course, you run this incredible campaign, uh, Stop Uyghur Genocide. Um, you've been all over Parliament for, for such a long time that, um, that, uh, that of course, uh, we know a lot about the situation of, of the Uyghurs. But now, of course, now that the situation in Ukraine is, is very dire and with Putin's attack on Ukraine, this, the focus um, moved slightly from, from the situation of the Uyghurs. So could you update us about what is happening to the situation of, of Uyghurs? What are the news? Obviously, the situation is not improving. We know that. But what is happening to the community? So thank you. That's a very good question, Ola. I was listening to Hamira. I was just thinking how similar it is, you know. Um, the perpetrators, they always try to uh, hide their crimes. It's always the case. And uh, a lot of people say that, you know, um, there's no um, evidence of mass killings. I say there is, for now we don't know. We simply don't know. I know a lot of families, and also uh, that they lost loved ones. I just read a one uh, <coughs> recent Radio Free Asia report. A, uh, a man was released five days after died. And this is so many like a repeating kind of stories that I have been hearing uh, for the last six, seven years. Um, recently, someone uh, from mainland China um, left message on my uh, Facebook messenger and uh, um, who's actually Uyghur and asking for help saying that you know um, the, the Chinese regime is really spreading this disinformation campaign and uh, using like Uyghurs, Uyghur girls to you know appear in like videos and saying that we are very happy, uh, everything is, is good, but it's not like that. The situation is bad. Um, yes, a lot of people are released, uh, but <coughs> either they physically or uh, psychologically completely damaged, or there are large uh, suicide rates after, uh, after the release. And I listened to one case um, about two months ago. Um, someone from Turkey um, said that this uh, neighbor who was released, um, she just sat in a corner, refused to speak to anyone. He didn't want to see anyone. And then on the third day, um, committed suicide. 
so you can imagine what happened to them while in detention. So it's extremely difficult to get any information at the moment. Uh, the latest information we had was the leaked files. Uh, you know, they call it Xinjiang files, mm -hmm. those pictures, so almost 3,000 human faces that we saw. Um, then again, though, those pictures were taken when they were detained in 2018, 2017. Uh, we don't know what happened to those people. And uh, as far as I know, from some uh, Uyghurs were allowed to leave um, because of family members or um, in Turkey. Um, they're saying the exactly same thing. Situation is not changed. Everywhere is like prison. We cannot move freely. Everyone is scared. Still just ter terrified even like go out. Um, and uh, uh, someone told me that uh, he visited the region, um, went to school to pick up his friend's uh, child, and uh, the child didn't speak Uyghur language, didn't speak Uyghur at all, it was just speaking Chinese. So he asked his friend, uh, why didn't he try to teach uh, the child? He said they would be punished if they spoke the Uyghur language. And also, like uh, primary schools, uh, the teachers also punish uh, uh, kids if they spoke uh, Uyghur language because they deduct the, um, the marks so that no one want the class. They have the lowest mark when they, so that, that is one of the criteria. And also because installing all these cameras in the schools, in nurseries and everywhere, that uh, is this digital surveillance that they can pick up if someone is speaking Uyghur language or Chinese. So Uyghur language immediately, they can, uh, they, it can get flagged and uh, the teacher punished for uh, allowing uh, the kids to sp speak the language. So this is a, a like mass um, assimilation and a forced assimilation uh, program is happening. Let alone, let's not talk about <coughs> religion. It is impossible. Um, so the same guy said uh, his children, when they come home, uh, they always say that there is no God. You know, Xi Jinping is our father. Uh, so they, this is a kind of education that is, uh, you know, in, in schools, in, in everywhere. Um, we know the UN report that <laughs> you mentioned, Lord Alton, you know, how long it took to publish, to get, to get that published. And they didn't really have unfettered access to really uh, find out real information. And we know uh, the forced marriages are uh, happening. Uh, very frequently, we see some TikTok videos that was, uh, you know, sent out. There's one video, uh, really heartbreaking. This girl um, said, please allow me to speak my language on that video. And uh, she said in Uyghur, dear father, dear mother, uh, it's my uh, wedding day today, but there is no one Uyghur here with me. So we ask where her father, where is his mother, anyone else? So after, uh, you know, imprisoning these, uh, their parents and brothers, and then these women are forced to marry the Han Chinese man. Um, and of course the um, family, uh, what you call family uh, relative program, or the, 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 the program that Han Chinese carders living in, in the Uyghur family homes, that is ongoing. Uh, the carders has to spend at least seven days in a month 
in a family to monitor, uh, you know, and also the destruction of culture, uh, the religion, the traditions, the people don't even allow to have nikah, the religious blessing, the basic religious blessings when uh, we would get married, um, and also the funeral. That we, when, when I was there, at least I know f until I spoke to my brother in 2017, early 2017, these was at least people were allowed. It's a normal kind of uh, cultural tradition, not necessarily religious. It become part of your uh, uh, kind of tradition, and but that was also banned. So Uyghurs cannot even have the blessing from uh, the imam. Uh, when they get married, and also uh, the funeral, they also ban the, the uh, proper Islamic burial procedures. Um, so it's, it's really, really uh, difficult. Um, and for me, I still don't know what happened to all my sisters and brothers. If things have changed, I'm sure they would have found a way to send me a message. Uh, still, uh, I uh, hear from other people as well. Um, some, they received a message. Um, they, uh, two people I know in Turkey, uh, this is how he received a message. It was a police, the neighborhood police called him on his WeChat and then show him his family members. And so he doesn't know whether the, 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 his children were at home or whether he, uh, they were in uh, the orphanage. So obviously on the video you just cannot, uh, you don't know. So through police, you know, neighborhood police, to call them and uh, show, showing them. The reason this policeman called him was to tell him to shut up, do not say to the world that you don't know what happened to your family. Here are uh, the, your family. Here are your children. This is this this is not just I think uh, a kind of individual or singled out case. It's quite common. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rahima. And you told us some of heartbreaking stories, um, but also not knowing what is happening to family members. I think this um, this is something that for, for many of us it is very difficult to, to imagine the the pain and suffering that that, that causes. So we we are here all of us to, um, to support you in the work that you do with the Stop um, Uyghur um, Genocide and any work that you do. We are, we are here um, to, to support in anything that needs to be done. Thank and thank you, you very much for, for sharing it all with us. And now we'll turn to Professor <coughs> Rayman. And I have hundreds of questions to Professor Rayman, um, especially on Iran um, and what is happening to the girls uh, with the poisonings. <coughs> Uh, whether the atrocities against and the targeting of women and girls we can call gender apartheid. This is something that is now there, but, uh, but, but I won't ask them now, maybe, maybe later during um, yeah. coffee break. Yeah. Um, but just hearing the stories from Homira, from Rahima, um, hearing the horrible suffering of the communities, uh, what, in your opinion, um, is um, why it is so important to recognize the atrocities as genocide? And Lord Alton, of course, already mentioned a little bit, but let's say Lord Alton is biased. It's, it's all about his book uh, there, but, but you, are, as an independent expert, um, if you could just share with us your opinion. Thank you, Evelina. Can I just begin uh, by congratulating you and Lord Alton on that excellent, on this excellent publication. I'm really looking forward to reading it in more detail and, uh, of course, learning from it. So, congratulations. And if I can just say uh, how inspirational Lord Alton has been to my career, uh, I think he has been the one figure which I've always looked up to. And I, I remember uh, one trip that we did together to Pakistan in 2018 and, and, and the tremendous impact that it had on the minorities and people who were suffering. Um, no doubt um, our meetings, uh, including uh, the Supreme Court, I think it helped uh, Asya Bibi's case, but also many others. And I think that was such an influential visit. And I'm grateful to Lord Alton for that. So thank you. And I also wanted to thank um, you know, uh, Notre Dame Law School for organizing this excellent, very informative, useful um, uh, discussion. 
So, so, so to the question, I think uh, it is really important. It is actually crucial for us to recognize uh, the genocide that's taking place. Uh, on my side, uh, we, we have learned, and it's, it's heart-wrenching to, to hear of all of this. But I'll tell you, uh, in my own background, uh, I, come, I was raised in Pakistan, I was born in Pakistan. It borders both these countries, you see. Uh, and actually, um, we didn't have time, but uh, Hazaras are also victims of genocide in Pakistan. Uh, on, the, on the point of China, I see that there is so much hypocrisy and duplicity from my own government and from members of the OIC, the 57 of them, who are never talking about genocide or gross violations of human rights that take place in, in China. You see, I mean, you can see Pakistan's stance, and I, I am ashamed, but I always tell them that, you know, this is hypocrisy at the highest level. So in terms of uh, recognizing the significance, uh, you only have to look back at what the UN did after 1945. Obviously, that was the most important impression on the UN um, institutions. So if you look at the General Assembly, in its very first session in 1946, there was a resolution adopted on the crime of genocide. And what the General Assembly unanimously did was to recognize uh, that there is a crime uh, in international law, both in war and in peace. And those people who commit genocide must be punished, you see. So there was a unanimous recognition. And the, the General Assembly moved really swiftly. Uh, within two years, a convention was adopted. And we have to remember, Lord Elton mentioned the UDHR. But the convention was adopted on the 9th of December, a day before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it is a really significant moment for us. I mean, uh, I hope uh, I will have an opportunity to talk about the, the limitations. But symbolically, it is so important. I mean, there are many lacunas in the convention itself. But there is an absolute recognition and determination that uh, genocide cannot go unpunished. It will be uh, it will be on high on the agenda of international community, and people who commit genocide will be held accountable. And uh, that is why I think it's really important to recognize uh, both contemporary and historic instances of genocide. Thank you very much. And when we look at the Genocide Convention, of course, it, it is not only about defining genocide. It also imposes duties, duty to prevent, duty yeah. to punish. Yeah. And uh, considering that we are doing very little to prevent um, genocide and also very little to punish, yeah. um, is it only symbolic? Um, and what kind of changes would you like to see um, around the world, including in this country? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that, uh, regrettably, in a lot of instances, so for example, if you look at uh, where there has been accountability, there have been other mechanisms. So for example, the Security Council set up a mechanism for Yugoslavia, for, uh, for Rwanda. Now we have the ICC. They have their own limitations. I mean, ICC is a, is a treaty, um, uh, treaty-based organization. So it cannot uh, have universal jurisdiction. Similarly, the tribunals that I mentioned, they were for, for very limited scope. Now, um, I think that there are uh, gaps in the convention. There are very serious omissions. So for example, the idea that the, the genocide of which in the territory where it takes place would eventually try it. You know, there'll be trials. That was naive and that was, you know, many jurists and academics said it, that this is not going to work. The other idea was that there would be uh, an international penal tribunal with global jurisdiction. That also, uh, as we are witnessing now, is, is an impossible, impractical situation. So, uh, I think what needs to be done, and this I, I can relate it to my own mandate, uh, that there is a need, and of course, before I say that, I, I really appreciate what Lord Elton and his initiatives are uh, for um, you know, recognition of genocide and accountability in this regard. So, I really value that. On top of that, what I would like to say, and I, again, uh, relates back to my UN mandate, is the is the value of universal jurisdiction. You see, uh, individuals who have perpetrated crimes against humanity, including genocide, must be held accountable. 
And therefore, um, if uh, an individual is apprehended in this country or elsewhere, there should be universal jurisdiction. Now, I know that there are challenges, there are issues of sovereign immunity, there are issues about uh, diplomatic relations, but I think we have overcome that. For example, if you look at the torture convention, you see, torture is now the prohibition and the punishment is now recognized as a, as a universal jurisdiction crime, you see. So if we have a criminal offense similar to what we have in the case of torture, uh, equivalent to the, the issue of genocide, I think we would be in a lot more progressive situation. And I think uh, the added advantage would be that it would be a deterrent. And I say that because, uh, you know, uh, in the case of Iran, for example, last year in Sweden, we tried and convicted, um, uh, it wasn't me, but the Swedish courts, but there was a lot of support from the international community. There was a conviction procured for someone who had committed war crimes in 1988, and he was in Sweden, so he was apprehended. So what I would like to see is universal jurisdiction, people who have committed genocide, not to be able to escape justice, no matter at what point in their career they would, they would leave their country, they would leave their territory, and ultimately there would be courts of justice in this country or elsewhere who could try them. Thank you very much. And indeed, for example, Lord Alton already mentioned that Daesh fighters have been prosecuted for and convicted for of, of genocide and crimes against humanity in Germany. Yeah. And Germany is using a very broad um, approach to uh, to the principle of universal jurisdiction. Yeah. In the UK, there are certain limitations in terms of whom um, British courts can actually prosecute under the uh, principle of universal jurisdiction. Does it mean that we have a new project for Lord Alton to introduce um, I, th I think that I think that Lord Alton is already there. Um, I, I mean, international law is quite tricky. You know, if you look at customary international law, I think there are certain very serious offenses in international law, uh, crimes against humanity, torture, and genocide whereby the courts could have inherent jurisdiction. I think that's really important to impress upon courts that individuals who have committed serious crimes of international law cannot escape justice. And I think that should be the way forward, that universal jurisdiction, uh, people who have serious uh, allegations must not be able to travel. And I, I can tell you uh, when President Ibrahim Raisi went to the United States, that was my argument, that this man is arguably having committed very serious violations of human rights, including genocide, including crimes against humanity. There should be no immunity for these people. And therefore, I think that international law must recognize that some crimes are so serious that diplomatic immunities must be overcome and these people should be held accountable. Thank you very much. And, and before we conclude, I wanted to ask a question to one question to each of you, and it, it is: What would you what would you like us to do? Uh, what else would you like us to do? If there is one recommendation for everyone here in in this room, apart from Lord Alton, I think he, it, there's already plenty on his plate. But what everyone in this room can do to help your communities and and of course to support your work um, as as UN Special Rapporteur or any other project? Shall I start, please? Um, become allies for the Hazaras and to read a little bit more. Uh, we really need the engagement of academics, lawyers. I mean, if anyone is interested, maybe build a case against Taliban for crimes of genocide. Um, as as our professor here, my colleague, was talking about, there's a lot of them that, you know, Taliban who've committed so many atrocities are roaming around for free. Um, and uh, we haven't seen any justice. Uh, the culture of impunity in Afghanistan is so severe that We've seen no accountability and justice in Afghanistan ever. Uh, maybe we can start today. Uh, maybe we can start for the crimes of genocide they've committed against the Hazaras. They're all still alive. They're still committing those atrocities in Afghanistan. So we really need uh, academic, um, academics, researchers, lawyers to engage in that and uh, to publish more papers, policy briefs, recommendations for the governments and what they should do. The Hazar inquiry was a fantastic start, probably the first assessment that was done to this extent where we said that Hazaras are at risk of genocide. But, you know, that's, I don't think it's enough. We need a more, more investigation, we need more data out there, we need more awareness, and we need more engagement from 
different communities across the different sectors. Thank you very much. Rahima? Okay. Did you say just one thing or? Just yeah. one. Let's start with one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think most effective, I mean, the current most important work that the Stop Uyghur Genocide is doing, um, that um, we need more resources to have more people uh, work for Stop Uyghur Genocide. We have quite a lot of projects, uh, we believe, on forced labor and many other things. So if you can do one thing is to donate to the Stop Uyghur Genocide, sign up with the um, newsletter, and so that with newsletter you will be updated with the work for what we are doing. And uh, at the moment, from next month, it will be just me and uh, Isabella, just two of us. So in order for me to have uh, several more people, um, we need resources and we really um, need uh, support on this. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. I think um, from my UN mandate, I would say, and I, I would echo what you have just said, that we must work towards um, eradicating uh, violence against women. You see, I have come across so much violence that's taking place in that region, particularly what the Iranian regime has done towards women. There must be a crime of, um, of gender apartheid. And it isn't uh, one state or two states. The whole of international community must support me in calling violence against women, the brutality against women, as a crime in international law, as a gender apartheid, so that we do not see uh, a recurrence of what, what we are seeing in Iran. And as you mentioned, the poisoning of girls. I mean, that is completely unacceptable. And I think the international community must stand up to Iran. I mean, I know that there are interests, you know, the Russians and the Chinese, they will work in, you know, in cahoots with the Iranians. But we cannot allow that. And I would urge the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, my own country, but many others, that violence against women cannot be accepted, cannot be tolerated. Women deserve equality. Girls uh, deserve education. And that also applies to Afghanistan and in the case of China, you know, what we have heard about deprivation of cultural rights and religious rights. So that would be my one plea to, to all of us here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I ask you to join me in saying a big kudos to our wonderful panelists, two uh, brief updates about what is happening in Parliament. Uh, next week, on 21st of March, we have a session with uh, IPU British Group, International Bar Association, Human Rights Institute, and the Coalition for Genocide Response. And we will be looking into the duty to prevent genocide with Lord Alton uh, presenting his bill, uh, Genocide Determination Bill, and Baroness Kennedy, uh, KC, talking about her genocide prevention bill, and hopefully also a few other speakers. And on the 28th of March, we have a session on um, the crime uh, of aggression in Ukraine, and Arif, who is here with us, uh, will be leading a session there about the special tribunal for, for the crime of aggression. So please join us. And now let's say a big massive kudos to our wonderful panelists.